Hey guys, this is Batman Mark, and we're here at Nerds in a Bar at Big Apple Comic Con in New York City. And I'm here with the one, the only, the Batman's Batman, Michael Uslin. Happy to be here. It's an absolute pleasure of mine. You have no idea. Thanks. Uh, I love being at Comic Cons. I was at the first Comic Con. I haven't missed one, co except for the COVID year when there were none, I haven't missed one Comic Con annually. I think I'm going on number 57 or 58 at this God time. God bless you. Being a huge impact on my life, as Batman has been since 66, I knew you have issues with the 66 Batman. Can you explain that and why? I can certainly explain it. When that came on the air, it was the one and only iteration of Batman around the world. People who never read a comic book before only knew the funny, pot-bellied comedian who was dancing the bat walking around with a live bomb, dealing with bat-shark repellent, and the whole world was laughing at Batman, and that killed me as a hardcore Batman fan in 66. I had met Bill Finger twice. He told me how Batman was created. He told me it was meant to be a creature of the night, stalking demented criminals in the shadows. So... Um, it, it just killed me that people were laughing at Batman. And that's when I vowed someday I would be able to show the, uh, the world through movies a dark and serious version of Batman, the way he was created in 39. Now, it's different today. Because today, there are so many different interpretations out in the media about Batman. You can see Tim Burton's Batman, Chris Nolan's Batman, Matt Reeves' Batman. You could see the animated Batman. You could see Batman Brave and Bold, which was really animated for kids. Batman meets Scooby-Doo. The Lego Batman. So right now, I embrace the TV series because it is a great way for young kids to be introduced to the world of Batman and then grow up and evolve and, and then follow the new cartoons, follow the movies, and grow into it. And, and so I think it has its place today. That's exactly what I wanted to say to you, is that back when I was two years old, I didn't see the comedy or the camp in it. I saw Adam West as Batman, Bruce Wayne being serious and, come on Robin, we've got to stop the bad guys. I'm five foot five, I was the first one to get glasses, I was the first one to get braces, Batman was real for me. And me, same thing. I was one of the last ones picked for Little League, you know, um, that wasn't my thing. Um, I, I felt more at home being up in my treehouse with my comic book superheroes. Exactly. And for me, watching Adam West as Batman portraying that do-gooder, that straight-laced character he portrayed was laughter to all the adults, was really ringing home to me that I could be Batman. Adam and I wound up doing a panel together. I don't remember if it was San Diego Comic-Con or New York Comic-Con, and we had never met before. And there had always been this tension. Um, he never uh, acknowledged in a positive way what we had done, and um, th th there was just a little tension there. So Adam sits down next to me, we shake hands, and he goes, and it was a jam-packed room. He said, I want to make an announcement. He said, I have learned over the years that there is room for more than one interpretation of Batman and that everything done by Jerry Robinson, everything done by Michael is just as valid as anything we ever did. And he goes, and I know Michael feels the same way. And with that, I turned to him, I said, Adam, every once in a while, I like to let eight-year-old Michael out. And if you don't mind, I would like to let him out right now. So he smiled, he said, okay. And I turned and looked at him, he goes, and I said, Oh my God, I'm sitting next to the real true Batman of the 1960s. Holy shit. <laughs> and with that, the whole place cracked up. He stood up, gave me a bear hug. I gave him a bear hug and all was right with the world. I met Adam West in 1987 at the Hotel Pennsylvania when it was the Penta Hotel at a creation convention. And I actually sat and interviewed him for an hour and a half. He invited me up to his hotel room where we talked about Batman and his creation and his idea for Batman. And it was just, a, it was one of my lifetime dreams. And this year, meeting you is my second lifetime dream come true. So thank you so much. The last, the last thing I have to ask you real okay. quick, okay? I know you know about the Bill Murray, Ed Murphy supposed script that was out there floating around. 
There was no script. There was no script, but there was there was a hint of them wanting to do it. What was the story behind that? I don't know the whole story. Anything, you know, a lot of times you sit in rooms and you sit in meetings and different names get tossed around or kicked around. A lot of times you make writer's lists, director's lists, actor's lists. They said, all right, let's uh, check out his credits. Let's check out who represents this guy or that guy. It doesn't mean somebody's seriously considered for a role. It's just part of a long process that things get kicked around. And I'll tell you point blank, any discussion of that that might have taken place was deliberately taken place outside of my earshot. Good. I never heard a whisper of it Good. at that time at all. I, I got to be honest with you, I would have been very upset if that's what had occurred. And I was a little upset with as much as Joel Schumacher did for the fandom, it, it, I was upset by, by his movies. Um, as I said in my talk recently, yes. sometimes movie studios get very enamored with toys, games, and Happy Meals. Exactly. And when that happens, it doesn't always filter down in a good way to making quality films. But thank you for bringing us back to this dark noir style, The Batman. And I have to tell you, I knew that Robert Pattinson could pull off Bruce Wayne as soon as I saw the movie Cosmopolis. All the credit goes to Matt Reeves. The man is a genius. What he has done following people like Todd Phillips, Christopher Nolan, Tim Burton, Bruce Tim, has been just absolutely incredible. And all I tell everybody is the second and third viewings are the best. You miss so much the first time. It kind of bowls you over. I'm, I'm on the second viewing. I'm going for the third soon. I, you always see something else. So, Michael... The book is a sensational hit. Your first book, The Boy Who Loved Batman, and now The Batman's Batman. Tell us, what else is going on with this book, Batman's Batman? Well, it was just published March 1st, amazingly coincidental with the opening of the Batman movie. How coincidental? Isn't that amazing? <laughs> uh, and even more incredible, the audiobook version of Batman's Batman went on sale exactly the same day. Um, I had the pleasure of narrating my own book. So I get to listen to you on Audibles. You get to listen to me as I tell you stories while you're falling asleep at night. <laughs> <laughs> and I also did the audiobook version of The Boy Who Loved Batman, and that's going to be on sale in May. So uh, I'm, I've kind of become my hero, Gene Shepard. You, <laughs> you might not remember Gene Shepard. I listened to him every night on WR Radio growing up in New Jersey. He used to tell stories, great nostalgic stories. One of his stories was made into a movie called A Christmas Story. Yes! And Gene narrated it. Oh, that's great. And he is my, he was my idol. Um, so I try to narrate it in the style of Gene Shepard narrating A Christmas Story. My first book detailed the story of how when I was a kid in my 20s, I bought the rights to Batman from DC Comics and set out to make dark and serious Batman movies only to be shocked and as I was turned down by every studio in Hollywood and be, was told it was the worst idea they ever heard and I was crazy. As a result, it took me 10 years from the time I bought the rights to Batman until we got our first Batman movie made in 1989 with Tim Burton, Michael Keaton, and Jack Nicholson. And then history changed for everyone and everything and the whole industry. And that detailed that human endurance contest that I had to go through because I was just a blue-collar kid from New Jersey to make my dreams come true. And it was a struggle, to say the least. Batman's Batman is all about my adventures, but more about my misadventures in Hollywood over the last 45 years. It's got another 120 anecdotes, and it contains some things that I know comic book fans are going to be shocked at, such as that I was for a minute and a half involved in a Doctor Strange TV series that Wes Craven was going to direct, or that I had the rights and was developing Luke Cage Hero for Hire as a movie with Motown Productions, and how I had the chance to buy Marvel Comics for $95 million in the 1990s. It's just loaded with lots and lots and lots of stories. So um, I'm very proud of it. It's very nostalgic, and I think every comic book or comic book movie fan will feel, oh my God, this could be my story. 
What's on the horizon for you next? After the Audible books, what do you got going on next? You mentioned something about uh, play? Yeah, I am thrilled that the Niederlander Organization of New York, which is, along with the Schubert's, the dominant player in the world of Broadway, um, is taking my book, The Boy Who Loved Batman, as supplemented by Batman's Batman, and they're turning it into a Broadway show with the hopes of opening early in 2023. So I am really excited. It's being fast-tracked, and it's kind of, in a sense, a Christmas story for kids who grew up reading comic books. Everybody, Michael Uslin, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today. Happy to do it. Good luck. For Nerds in a Bar, I'm Batman Mark with the Batman's Batman. Have a great day, everybody. We'll see you on the next episode of Nerds in a Bar.